king, you're our Lord. God, you're our friend and our father. God, we come here this morning, oh God, with hearts open to receive from you. God, your church, oh God, needs your presence because without you, it's just another social club. But God, with you, at the center of it all, God, our minds can't even fathom what can happen. So God, this morning, oh God, come into our hearts and stay. Dwell with us, oh God, so that your light, oh God, may shine within us, oh God, and we, therefore, outside into the world, God, help us to bring clarity to those, oh God, who are in the dark. Help us, oh God, to bring your Son, Jesus Christ, before them so that they too can experience the joy of knowing you. Forgive us where we've gone wrong. And help us, oh God, to lean not on our own understanding, but in everything, oh God, seek your guidance, your strength, so that your name may be glorified and listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, God loves you and so do I. The call to worship. We begin by singing the first verse of Amazing Grace. How many times in our lives have we felt lost, alone, abandoned?
Let us pray together. We praise you, O God, for being not only the God of history, but the God of our story. You have gathered us here today to remind us that although you are the one to whom all our lives, yet you care for the weak and powerless. You care for us. We praise you for joining your story to ours in such a special way through Jesus, our Lord. He proved his great love for you. And for each person in the way you lived, realizing what was captive, lifting up the burden, seeking out the loss, and powering the powerless, we marvel at you at the depth of your care for us. And in many ways, our lives have been blessed by the sacrificial life and love of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. Merciful God, you bring our lives in harmony with yours because of your righteousness and justice, your steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. Those are the qualities of your life which be clearly imprinted, which were clearly imprinted on us, on Jesus' heart, and which have been written on our hearts, not in ink, but with your spirit. We are to be living testimonies that the spirit gives life, life in all its fullness. We confess that while we readily accept the joy of living spirit-filled lives, we all too often fail to live up to the challenges that brings when we fail to translate the language of our hearts into one that includes all evil. Living God, forgive us and renew our lives with your spirit. When we alienate others by our judgmental and heartless attitudes, Living God, forgive us. When our witness fails to reveal a heartfelt desire to spread the good news of peace, love, justice, and mercy to a world solely in need of such news. Living God, we come to you in penitence and faith, praying that your love. So clearly communicated by Jesus, may be rewritten on our hearts and revealed in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God to whom we have been reconciled through Christ.
despite of our despicableness, God. Despite of our ugliness, God. Despite of our frailty, God. God, despite of our, of, of our weaknesses, God. You've loved us, God. And you've made us to stand in your presence. God, you said, oh, we are righteous. We are made righteous in you, God. So, God, we wish we put off God everything that would beset us even now, God. We speak to all the past a week, God. I said, God, now because we are in you, we are new creatures, God. All things are past for me. We are no longer encumbered by the past. The devil is a liar. God is the accuser of the brethren. And we recognize him for who he is even now, God. And so, God, we stand. We stand because we know who we are in Christ Jesus. We know that we have been born, we have made.
churros in God's heart. We are God's beloved. God loves you guys. God loves you. God loves you so much. So much that when mothers of Salem were bringing their children to Jesus, the disciples began to send the children back and Jesus said to them, no, 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 stop it. Bring the children to me and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus declared to the adults and he said, unless you are going to become one of my disciples, if you're going to become a member of my kingdom, you have to become like a little child. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? God is saying to us that if we want to become one of his disciples, we have to become like you. And guess what? It means that you have a lot to teach us about what it means to be a Christian. And we want to bless God for you. And I want to pray with you right now. Bow your heads with me, close your eyes, and let us pray. God, we give you thanks for these children that you have blessed us with. We bless you, God, for their lives, for their laughter, for their inquisitiveness, for their trust, for their love. God, we bless you for all the good qualities in these children's lives. And for the ways in which their lives have been a blessing to us. They have taught us to laugh even when there is pain. They have caused us to smile on tough days when we thought that we couldn't get through and we encountered one of these children, they brought hope to our hearts. And for that, O oh God, we give you thanks. And we ask, O oh God, that Jesus will continue to be their friend. Because Jesus was a child just like them and has left an example for them and for all of us. And oh God, we pray that they will seek to know you, love you, and allow you to take the highest place in their hearts. God, I give you thanks today for their parents. And I pray, oh God, for strength for them. I pray that you will give wisdom to their parents that they will know how to lead them aright. That they will know how to set before them true examples of godliness. And so, Lord God, let your Holy Spirit rest upon these children. Let your Holy Spirit saturate them and fill them to the overflowing with joy and peace and laughter. Oh God, I pray that you will continue to bless their homes with laughter and with joy. Oh God, I pray that you will give the parents grace to appreciate them, to put up with them, to bear with them, to understand them. Oh Lord God, I pray that their parents will not be broken, but they will stand firm in the things of godliness and righteousness. So that our future will be safeguarded as a nation. Because these children will one day become the men and the women, the leaders of our nation. And oh God, we pray that they will lead with integrity and foresight. And so God, we pray right now that your Holy Spirit will fall upon them. For Christ's sake. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. And see you to church soon. And I long to worship. And anybody long to worship God this morning? Anybody long to worship God? If you long to worship God, just stand with me and just bless His name. Hallelujah. The
again. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, the battle is on. The battle is on. Hallelujah. Are you with me? I want to show you how true worship can win battles in your life. I want to show you how true worship brings victory. So again, say to your neighbor, the battle is on. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Menuhites, came against Josaphat for battle. Messengers came and told Josaphat, a great multitude, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. Say to your neighbor, a great multitude. A great multitude is coming against you from Edom. From beyond the sea, already they are at Harazon. Tama. Josephat was afraid. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the towns of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. The place, Jerusalem. The man, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. A good king, the son of Asa. During Jehoshaphat's reign, there was peace and prosperity because Jehoshaphat was a man of the book. He was a man of God. More than anything else, he wanted to do what God said. And therefore God honored him for that commitment and God made him great. But a crisis arose. A surprise attack from the southeast. Three nations Three nations suddenly moved against Judah. Moab, Ammon, and Menuhites. Without warning, they crossed the Dead Sea. Even now, they were only 40 miles away. The attack came from nations nursing ancient hostility. Long memories of perceived slights, anger, jealousy now boiling over. The danger was very real. The news came this way. A vast army is coming against you. A vast army is coming against you. This is a message that Joseph had to receive. A vast army is coming against you. They have crossed the Dead Sea and are already in NG. Another day or two or three and the enemy will be at the gates of Jerusalem. Verse 2 adds a significant phrase in our passage. A vast army is coming against you. That made it personal. Are you with me, church? A vast army is coming against you. I'm not talking here about the church. I'm talking to you individually and personally because the message came to Joseph that personally a vast army is coming against you. Not just against Judah, not just against Jerusalem, but against the king himself, Jehoshaphat. This was the true test of one man's faith in times of crisis. What will he do? 
Man may do many things in a time of crisis. He may cover up. Some give up. Others panic. Still others deny they have a problem. Verse 3 reveals the key response. Joasabat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Are you following me? Joasabat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Everything turns on this fact. That was the decisive moment. It's not the crisis that destroys men. It's what we do or don't do when the crisis hits. The crisis never destroys. It is our reaction or inaction that determines the outcome. No one can avoid a moment like this. The first few moments, the first hours, the first days, the, the way you respond when your back is against the wall, that's when you discover what you are made of. What do you do when your land is invaded? Get the guns? Call the army? That would make sense. Because Judah had a large, well-trained army. Not this time. Not this time. Jehoshaphat did something that by human standards made absolutely no sense. Imagine, he gets the word. A vast army is coming against you. They are almost there. Jerusalem had a well-trained army and Jehoshaphat did not stand, did not call the generals and said, organize to go to battle. Jehoshaphat did something that seems ridiculous. Something unheard of. Something that does not seem to make sense. He called a nationwide fast and asked the people to join him in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. <laughs> Can you imagine this? His land is about to be invaded and the only thing he can think about is calling a prayer meeting. I'm sure that there are many who would say, what a waste of time. I'm sure there are many who would say, we are losing time here. There are many who would be saying, we need to do something more practical. Are you with me, church? Jehoshaphat calls a prayer meeting. Now that's crazy by all human standards. Common sense says, don't waste time. There's a time to pray and a time to fight. <laughs> and common sense says, no, it's not the time to pray. No, it's the time to fight. Now's the time to fight. Oh no, says Jehoshaphat. Now is the time to pray. His prayer recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And if you look from verse 6 through to verse 12, is Jehoshaphat's prayer. And it stands as one of the greatest prayer in all the Bible. Two things strike me about this, this prayer. And this is the great faith here and great simplicity. First of all, his faith. There is a faith in God's character. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you, declares Jehoshaphat. There is faith in God's promise. Did you not drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, was a question? And so at such a time like this, Jehoshaphat calls upon God's character. God, you said you were going to give this land to the descendants of Abraham. There were other people in this land. You drove them out and you brought your people here. Therefore, I'm going to stand 
on your promises. I'm going to stand on your actions in the past. I'm going to trust you with this one. And there is simplicity. There is only one request. And this request is, will you not judge them? There is only one complaint. See how they have repaid us in verse 11. There is only one confession. We have no power. Are you there? We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Am I talking to anyone here? Again, here to answer that. There is a confession. He declares, we have no power. We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But, but, our eyes are upon you. Am I talking to anyone yet? We get all mixed up. When we think about prayer, we look at the externals, the forms, the words, the length, whether we are standing or sitting, whether our eyes are open or shut, whether we phrase things in precisely the right way, but God looks at the internal, the faith, the sincerity, the honesty. He's not that interested in the outside. When he listens to prayer, he listens to the heart. Yes, to the heart. And Jehoshaphat's heart was in the right place. This isn't a very long prayer. But it saved the nation. It wasn't very complicated. But they got the job done. The answer wasn't long in coming. While the people were gathered in Jerusalem, the Lord spoke through a prophet named Jehaz Jehaziel. His message was simple. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid. And I'm reading verse 15. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Can you say to your neighbor, the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. And maybe I'm talking to someone here now, and you need to hear this again. That the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. Am I talking to anyone here? Take a moment to say for that phrase. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. I imagine Jehoshaphat was glad to hear that the prophet went on to give him very specific instructions. First of all, tomorrow you will march down to meet your enemies. Secondly, take your position, but you don't have to fight. Come on, God, you've got to be kidding me. Take your position, but you don't have to fight. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In the moment of crisis, our greatest danger is discouragement. We see the foe lined up against us and it scares us to death. After all, fear is well founded if you have to face a vast army with no help from above. The real question is, will you go in your own strength or will you go in the power of God Almighty who is and was and is to come? If the battle is yours, you're in trouble. Are you there? Because you see, maybe I'm speaking to some of you and, and there are battles in your lives. There are some things you're fighting. There are some struggles. There are some challenges. There are some difficulties. There are some monsters that you're battling. There are some Goliath that you face and maybe for a very very long time you have faced those Goliaths in your own strength you have faced the armies in your own strength you have faced the enemy in your own strength and I declare to you that the reason you have been losing is because you fight in your own strength the battle is not yours the battle is the Lord's Amen. I can hear David stand before Goliath, I can hear him say to Goliath, you come to me with javelin and spear and sword. Hallelujah! But I come to you in the name of the Lord. For the battle is the Lord's. If the battle is God's, you don't have to fight. You just have to take your position. I believe that I'm speaking to someone 
you need to take your position. You are out of position. Because you see, God is ready to do a mighty work in your life. God is ready to win some battles in your life. God is ready to destroy the enemy. God is ready to give you the victory. But you're out of place. Are you there? In other words, you're not where God wants you to be. Hmm? Am I talking this church? God is ready to give you the victory. Because the battle is God's. That is why God declared to Josephus and to the armies, take your position. And I'm speaking to someone right now and you know that you're not in the place where God has ordained you to be. You're not in the place where God has called you to be. You're not in the place where God can use you. You're not in the place where God can give you the victory. And so I declare to you, move and get in place. Come on someone, get in position. The prophet's final words were, go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Two things happen next. Joshua bowed down to the ground. And all the people of Judah fell to the ground and began to worship the Lord. The Levites stood up and began to praise God with a loud voice. Now we get to the good part of the story. I said all of that to bring you to the good part of the story. You ready for the good part of the story? The next morning, the army of Judah begins to move against the enemy. But it's the strangest battle and um, formation in history. Early in the morning, they left for the desert. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, people of Judah and Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as he went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Can you imagine the sight? Here comes the army of Judah. Thousands of men armed for battle. Who's at the head? Not the scouts. Not the archers. Not the warriors. Not the mighty men. The choir is leading. Am I talking to you? Am I talking to the choir? The priest team? The worship leaders? They're going out to battle. The enemy means business. The enemy has trained. The enemy has a plan, a strategy. The, the, the enemy has a battle plan. So how it's going to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. And it seems, it seems from, from, from just a glance that, that Jerusalem is not taking this seriously. Huh? That they are going out to battle with three mighty nations, great warriors, nations that have taken down other nations before. These were the nations that were greatly fair around. They were the terror nations. And Jerusalem and Judah goes out to battle. And this is their formation. They put the choir ahead. And what the choir does, the choir begins praise and worship. I don't think this is getting home to you yet. Are you following me, church? The choir leads the army in worship. In worship, they begin to sing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. This was a bold move. Either sinners will be killed in a great slaughter or God will come through. But this is God's battle. So the proper response is bold, audacious, 
Jesus worship what Josephus does seem like nonsense, but it makes perfect God sense. They saw that a silence enveloped a battlefield just before the first shot is fired. A tense living silence when all the world stops just before the roll of the guns. In that silent moment, men gather their thoughts, say their private prayer, and prepare to die. Military strategies tell us that nothing is more important in battle than achieving the element of surprise. If your enemy doesn't know that you're coming, perhaps the shock of the first assault will win the day. But guess what? Jerusalem and Judah takes away the element of surprise. They're going out to battle. They're going out to the enemy. And the enemy can hear them from a distance. The enemy knows exactly what direction they're coming from. The enemy has a sense of how many there are because of the voices that were being lifted up in praise to God. They were singing. They were shouting. They were giving praise and glory and honor to Almighty God. That's their strategy. This strategy would appear to be suicidal. In the first place, they were giving up all hope of surprise. Even the death could have hurt them. Who knows? Once the killing started, there was no way to stop it. Meanwhile, the army of Judah kept on marching, marching as they praised, as they worshipped, as they sing unto the Lord, as they sang praises unto Almighty God. And while they were doing this, you know what happened? Remember God said to them, the back is mine. Hmm? You know what happened? The enemy turned on each other. Are you there? The enemy turned on each other. They started killing each other. They started slaughtering each other. They destroyed each other. Who knows? Maybe two nations ganged up on the other. And then those two nations started fighting against each other. But whatever happened, they started fighting against each other. And while all of this was going on, guess what? The praise and worship continued. Guess what? Judah and Jerusalem continued to worship. They continued to sing. They continued to give glory to God. They continued to lift up the mighty name of God. And as the praise is for, as they worship God, all oh, the power of God was unleashed. As they worship God, God himself got into action. As they worship God, God himself went up before them. As they worship God, God himself got on the battlefield. As they worship God, the battle was being won. Oh, as they worship, the battle was being won. Sisters and brothers, let me tell you this. Worship is not for when the battle has been won. Worship is for when the battle is faces. Worship is for when the battle has just begun. Worship is for when we do not know the outcome. Trusting God that God is able to win every battle for us. That God is indeed able to justify his own name. And the worship and the worship and hallelujah the battle was won. And when we got to the plain, what they saw was unbelievable. Every last one was dead. I don't think I'm talking to the church yet. Every last one was dead. The Bible is specific on this one. No one escaped. Think of that. Not even one survivor. I'm not sure the last one died. <laughs> Every man who came to fight died that day. The men of Judah never shot.
shot an arrow, never threw a spear, they didn't fight at all, they marched out singing, and by the time they got to the battlefield, it was over, just like that, it was over, just like God said it would. In my Bible, the story is entitled, Jehoshaphat defeats Moab and Ammon. You know what's funny about that? He didn't lift a finger. But God gave him the victory. Just as how I believe that God is ready to give some people some victories right now. Just how I believe that God stands ready to win your battles for you. Just how I believe that God stands ready to fight on your behalf. Just how I believe that God stands ready to do the impossible in your life. Yes, the battles that you are thinking right now, you have already lost. The Spirit of God stands by you and the Lord says, Worship me! Worship me! Worship me! Yes, when you are done, the Lord says, Worship me! When you feel as though you are almost on, the, the Spirit of God says, Worship me! Worship me! There is victory in me! There is victory in the blood of Jesus! There is victory in worship! Sisters and brothers, understand what I'm saying. There is power in worship. Yes, yes, yes. The strong man can get defeated in worship. The territorial spirits can be sent fleeing in worship. You don't need to lift a hand. Just worship God and watch the power of God unleashed in your life. I hear the Spirit of God is saying that some of us need to learn how to surrender and worship. Yes. I hear the Lord say that you must worship in spirit and in truth when His Spirit bears witness with your spirit where you are lost in worship of Him. Friends, there are some battles to be won in your life. That are going to be won in worship. To bring to and his family. Even at this difficult time in your life. Watch God move in worship. Watch God do the impossible. As you worship Him, those of you who have gone through some stuff, or maybe going through some stuff right now, those of you who are faced with one health challenge after another, Financial difficulties, problems in your marriage, problems with your children. Where you're battling with generational curses, where you do not know where to go, where to turn, where sometimes it feels as though there is a strong man who's pulling you back. You want to do what is right. You want to move ahead. But every time you step out, you feel as though you're being dragged back. Worship God and watch Him. Watch Him break the shackles. Watch Him pull down the strongholds. Watch Him mend broken relationships. Watch Him supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. Watch Him open doors in your lives. Watch Him open opportunities for you. Worship Him. Give Him your all. Give Him the glory and the praise that God and God alone deserves. And watch Him. What about the plan? Just go to worship. And God did the rest. And God did the rest. Friends, God is calling this church to a deeper level of worship. 
God is calling this church to a deeper level of worship. Not out of a traditional sense. But a deeper worship where our hearts connect with God and with the worship that we offer to Him. God is calling us to a deeper level of worship where we are liberated in Christ to be all that He has called us to be. Where we are liberated to give Him our all in worship, not just with our voices, but also in our hands and our feet, with our entire being. You see, it took them three days to carry off the plunder of the enemy. Uniforms, equipment, weapons. On the fourth day, they had a praise gathering in the valley. And they called it the valley of praise. When they got back to Jerusalem, they had another praise gathering at the temple. This time with Old Testament combo. Hats, her trumpet. When the other nations heard what had happened, they decided to leave the people of God alone. Are you with me? When the other nations heard the battle that God won for Jerusalem and Judah, the other nations who were thinking of coming up against Jerusalem and Judah decided to leave them alone. And you see, when you begin to worship God and the breakthrough comes in the situation that you face, the enemy, even as he plans further for your life, will realize that he is no match for you and for your God and will decide to leave you alone. You see, the devil will continue to trouble you when the enemy knows that there is an opening. The enemy will continue to trouble you when the enemy thinks that he has a chance of defeating you. But the moment the enemy sees the blood of Christ, he passes over. Yes. The moment the enemy sees, and hears the name of God being invoked, he trembles. He backs up and he runs away because the enemy knows that he cannot stand against the power of God. The last time he tried was to keep Jesus down in a tomb. Oh, the enemy had them sealed up the tomb, had them placed guards at the tomb. And I tell you that resurrection morning when God came with one word, he rolled the stone away and his son Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He came out alive forevermore. The enemy knows that he can't stand against the power of God. And the man of God tells us that he who raised Jesus from the dead, that that power that raised him from the dead is the same power that resides inside of us. So God stands ready in worship to infuse you with a power that the enemy knows not to test you. So that God has to worship me. Worship me. Sisters and brothers, great things happen to us when we realize our powerless condition. The key to this victory is found at the end of Joseph's prayer. We have no power to face this vast army that is coming against us. Have you ever felt like that? What a great place to be. Have you ever felt powerless? Anyone else? Have you ever felt powerless? That's a good place to be. It's only when you're powerless that you will know how powerful your God is. It's yeah. the problem with us that too many of us, we're too powerful. Mm. Mm? Mm. We're too powerful. God can work with that. 
If we think we are powerful enough, God leaves us until we recognize our need for Him. Well, we, are, we, we are too independent and self sufficient. It's only when we recognize how weak we are, how powerless we are, how inadequate we are. We recognize how powerful God is, how awesome God is, that we are ready for the breakthrough. And that is why Joseph had recognized. He said, Lord, we can't deal with this one, you know. This one is too much for us. This one is too much for us. The whole story pictures our situation in the world. We are always outnumbered, always outnumbered, surrounded by the enemy. Somewhere we need to recognize that God is all powerful. The cultivation of worship is our means of spiritual victory. That's why this story is so crucial to the proper understanding of worship. Look at all that was involved in worshiping God. Fasting, gathering, praying, standing, bowing, falling down, loud praising, praising, and marching, singing and praising, praising in the valley, praising at the temple, cheering, rejoicing, thanks, thanksgiving, playing the harp, playing the mirror, sounding out the trumpet. Yeah, all that's involved in praise and worship. All that is involved in worship. We can take part and leave part. God is calling us to immerse ourselves in worship. They worship God before the crisis. They worship God during the crisis. And they worship God after the crisis. I'm not sure where you're at. Maybe you are before the crisis. It's a good time to start to worship God. Maybe you are in the crisis. It's an even better place to worship God. Maybe you have just come out of the crisis. It's also a good place to worship God. Hmm? Doesn't matter where you are at. Doesn't matter where you are at. It is in worship that you are going to see the hand of God move. And I'm laboring this because I believe that God is speaking to someone right now. Maybe you have been a bit casual about your worship of God. Maybe you have taken on a don't care attitude about the worship of God. Maybe you have not taken it serious. Maybe there are some persons who come to service but they don't come to worship. Huh? Maybe I'm talking to someone, you come to service, you come to church, but you don't come to worship. And God is calling us to a life of worship. Deep penetrated worship. When we feel and know his spirit dwells within us. And we declare by our outward action that God is God all by himself. I ask you to stand with me, church. I ask you to stand with me and just worship him. Let your living water over my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control of every situation that has troubled my mind.
And because of his life and his love for us. Jesus, knowing that his time on earth is coming to a close, instituted what we call the Lord's Supper as a means of remembering him. So every time the table is spread and we receive the bread and wine, we are remembering all God's goodness towards us. We are remembering Jesus and what he stood for and how his life was given for ours. But we are also recognizing the very presence of the living Christ amongst us. And knowing that with him in our lives, then we have got the victory. Knowing that with Jesus as our pioneer and the author of our faith, then our lives are secure with God in Christ. So on the night in which he was betrayed, he took birth. After looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given to you. After the supper was over, he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So whenever we eat the bread and we drink from the cup of salvation, we are proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. And he reminds us that he go to prepare a place for us and he will come again to take us unto himself so that where he is, there we may be also. We are reminded that this is only a foretaste of what is to come. It is not the complete. Because the complete is with God and Christ in glory. And when we get there, we will experience the complete of everything. When we take off mortality and put on immortality, we will feast with Him around His throne. With people from every nation, every language, every child all around the throne of God, those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so we give thanks to God for this reminder. But more than a reminder, we give God thanks for this means of grace. The means by which God meets us. empowers us gives us the strength to go on. Maybe you are here and you are weak. Maybe you are here and you are dis in distress. Maybe you are frustrated. Maybe life has been hard, harsh, difficult, challenging. Maybe you have given up on life or you have given up on some things in life or some aspects of life. When you come face to face with God in Jesus, God gives you hope to believe again, to trust again, to live again. This is not just bread and wine. This is God's personal encounter with us. God has come in Jesus Christ today to meet you at your point of coming. I'm sure that the needs are different. But with one common meaning, he can meet us all at that point of view. Having taken bread and wine, we are making a commitment that our lives are no longer our own, but that they belong to God. It is a commitment that we are making to Jesus, that Lord, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want you to help me with life. 
because I cannot live this life alone. I need support along the way. And you, God, you have everything that I need. Let us pray. Lord, we come to your table. Trusting in your mercy. Not in any goodness of all. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs on your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy. And that will be there. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ your son. That we may forever live in him. And in us. Amen. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to pass around you. To know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away.